and pray, and we'll get started. Uh, thank you, Jesus, so much for this time. Lord, I just thank you that you give us such wonderful examples that we can just follow through to this day, Lord, and so many applications in your word on how we can live lives that honor you and glorify you and, and just how much you love us, Lord. I thank you for those constant reminders in your word. Father, I pray that we can put all the distractions outside the door. There are many. I just pray for people on both sides, uh, in the Ukraine and the Russian people that don't even want to be there. Lord, please bless them. I just pray that your will will be done, whatever that looks like, that's so beyond our understanding. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you bless the moms having babies and, and the children and just everything going on over there, Lord, that's just uh, so difficult. So, Lord, we know you've got this. Please bless them. Please bless our country. And, Lord, I just pray that we can focus on you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us on the cross. In your precious name, amen. Um, what we're going to do is we're roughly going to do chapters 11 to 14 of Exodus. Uh, even as a speed teacher, I can't cover all that in one lesson, but there's so many lessons I want to pull out. Uh, we're going to end up at the Red Sea after they've crossed through, so we're going to be starting. But one thing I just wanted to go over again, um, because a lot of people said they'd never seen the parallels before between the plagues in Egypt and the plagues coming in Revelation, so just real quickly, I'm going to give you those references again so you can look at it. Um, a couple people talked to me after and said, boy, I'd really like to do more study. I just want to make sure that you have the references in case you didn't get them all last week so you can look them up. Uh, the first plague, the blood, Nile turning to blood, you'll see a similar thing again in Revelation three different times. Revelation 8.8, 8, the judgment, the second trumpet judgment. Revelation 16, the second bowl judgment and Revelation 16, the third bowl judgment. All of those involved turning water into blood. So the first plague in Egypt and those three references in Revelation, Revelation 8.8, 8, and then you're going to see a whole bunch of it uh, played out in Revelation 16. So Revelation 16, second bowl and third bowl. The frogs, similar, Revelation 16, 13, and 14. We see the three unclean spirits like frogs. It says they're the spirits of demons. So that's what's going to happen in Revelation that involves frogs. The lice in the third plague, you really don't see that again in the book of Revelation. You don't see anything that similar. Um, the fourth plague with the swarms, all the bugs, again, not, not uh, anything that really parallels. Um, one guy tried to make one, but I thought it was a stretch, so I'm not teaching it. Um, plague number five, pestilence. You, you don't need to stretch with God's word. God's word stands on its own. God is perfect, and everything he wrote was perfect, so we don't need to add or take away. The fifth plague with the pestilence, uh, you see that in the fourth seal, Revelation 6, 8. You see something, something similar there in the fourth seal. The sixth plague with the boils, you see similar in Revelation 16, verse 2, in the first bowl. The seventh plague, the hail and the fire, you see that in Revelation 8, verse 7, with the first trumpet. That's Revelation 8, 7. The locusts, plague number 8 in Egypt, you see it, something similar in Revelation chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. That's the fifth trumpet. And again, those are locust-like creatures then, but it's a good parallel. And then the ninth plague, darkness, you see that in Revelation 16, verses 10 and 11. That's the fifth bowl, the darkness that comes. Revelation 16, 10, and 11. So if you want to do your own research and just look at those again, you can do that. But I think the coolest one, and we're not going to get to chapter 15 of Exodus, but when they stand after they've crossed the Red Sea and they sing the song of Moses, okay, that's Exodus 15. It's also Revelation 15. You see this great multitude standing by a sea of glass in Revelation 15, and it says right in there, they sing the song of Moses. So this beautiful parallel... It, and, of course, God didn't put chapter and verse divisions in, but for us it's really easy. Exodus 15, Revelation 15. So you can look at that. And, and I'll be continually mentioning things that you can be looking at um, over the break. There's still a lot to pull out. But we're going to be talking about the wonders of God today and the things he can do. In the fall of 2000, doctors diagnosed Pastor Ed Dobson with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, it's an incurable and fatal disease. The doctors gave him two to five years to live and predicted, predicted that he'd spend most of that time in a disabled condition. 
He had been speaking at Moody Bible Institute, a pastor's conference a year or two after he received the diagnosis. He said shortly after he was diagnosed, he wanted someone to anoint him with oil and pray for healing. He wanted someone to pray who really believed in healing. So Ed invited a friend, a Pentecostal pastor who had regular healing services to come over and pray for him. He said it was one of the most moving evenings of of his entire life. The Pentecostal pastor began by telling stories of people that he had prayed for who were miraculously healed. But this is what I love too. He also told stories about people he had prayed for who were not healed and passed away, receiving the ultimate and final healing when they went to heaven to be with Jesus. Before he prayed for Ed, he gave him some advice. Don't become obsessed with getting healed, Ed. If you get obsessed with getting healed, you're going to lose your focus. Get lost in the wonder of God and what he will do for you. Same with us. Don't get so obsessed about physical healing or whatever that looks like. Get obsessed with God. Get lost in the wonder of God and who knows what he will do for you. In a book uh, Ed wrote in 2012, he said, this is some of the best advice I have ever received. Since that night, I've been trying to get and stay lost in the wonder of God. So I think we're going to see a lot of that today, just as we go through Exodus. You're going to see how completely God knows you. Going, wow, we're going back thousands of years and got to see that? Yeah, we are, in just an incredible way. We've seen the nine plagues. We've seen Pharaoh still resisting, changing his mind, trying to bargain. This guy is just so full of pride, he wouldn't just surrender. So let that never be said of us. So then in, in chapter 11... The final plague is threatened. But see, the thing is, God already told him. Right in chapter 4, in verses 21 and 22, God already said, if you don't let my firstborn go, Egypt, or I'm sorry, Israel, my firstborn, I'm going to take your firstborn. So he knew before the first plague even started what God was going to do. But in his obstinance and his stubbornness and his hard-heartedness, he just wouldn't surrender. So here it comes. Beginning of chapter 11, the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and then he will let you go. Speak now in the hearing of the people and say every man of his neighbor and every woman of her, of her neighbor, go get silver and gold jewelry. They were going to leave Egypt with plunder. Again, that was foretold in Exodus chapter 3. Okay, it's Exodus 3, 21 and 22. Why are they leaving with plunder? because they'd been slaves for 400 years with no wages. So when they come out of Egypt, God is saying, you bring silver and gold with you. Why are they going to need silver and gold? God's going to provide. Yes, he is, but he's also going to ask them to build the tabernacle. The high priest needed jewels for his breastplate, so they were coming out of Egypt with plunder to do God's work. Okay, so it wasn't stealing or anything else. It was basically their back wages, but God foretold that too. Because God knows everything. That's why it's really stupid when we argue with him. But anyway, so Moses, so the Lord gave people, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. That's chapter 11, verse 3. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So even though Pharaoh was being so hard-headed and so hard-hearted, other people recognized that Moses is God's man. And they saw all the signs and wonders and that Moses be, was great in the land because he was God's representative. Remember, Moses, when he approached God, it's who am I? And then when he saw, great are you. Moses had it right. Who am I and great are you? Versus Pharaoh, who went the other way. Remember the exact opposite? Who are you and great am I? Well, Pharaoh's burning in hell and Moses is in heaven. That's, that's the difference right there, Okay. So they recognized what Moses had done. So in in chapter 11, verse 4, Moses speaks God's word. About midnight, I'm going to go in the midst of Egypt. Every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl, all the firstborn of the cattle. Verse 6, there's going to be a great cry. You'll see as we go, God says exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as never been and never will be again. But verse 7 Um, really literally in the Hebrew, it says in uh, ESV, which I've got, but not a dog shall growl. It says in the Hebrew, not a dog shall um, sharpen his tongue. The dogs don't even bark. So there's going to, on the Israelite side, so there's going to be this great commotion. Imagine the screaming and wailing. 
when these mothers wake up and find their firstborn dead, when these fathers wake up and find their firstborn dead. But you know what? Over here in Egypt, if they put the blood over the door, you're not even going to hear a dog bark. You're not even going to hear a dog growl. So that's what that means. God is making the distinction. And then in verse 10, Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He brought to the surface what was really there. And the Pharaoh didn't let people go. In the face of that. Remember, he, he'd been warned way before the plague started. We saw it in chapter 4. He's warned again. But even in the face of that, Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. And then we see the progression. And like I said, we're just going to basically hit the high points because there's so many um, lessons for us in here. The Passover. God gives Moses very specific instructions. But one thing I don't want you to miss right in the beginning of chapter 12 the calendar resets. The calendar resets at this. Israel's calendar resets because this is going to be such an amazing event. This month shall for you be the beginning of months. Everything starts here. Everything starts with the lamb that's going to be slain, Moses. That's what God is saying to Moses in the beginning of chapter 12. And look at verse 3. I circled them in my Bible so I could watch the progression. Every man shall take a lamb. Okay, that's verse 3. Every man shall take a lamb. Then when you get to verse 4, according to what each of you shall, what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. And then verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. So it went from a lamb to the lamb to your lamb. That's what it is for all of us when we learn about Jesus. There's this Jesus, and, and we learn about him. And then, okay, and then there's the Jesus, but then he has to become your Jesus. Woo, there that went. Sorry. I hate being a telephone operator. All right. Yeah. So a lamb, the lamb, your lamb. It has to be personal, and we, we see it with those words right here. And, and you know what? They, they took the lamb into their house, for 10 days, or I'm sorry, on the 10th day, and they had it there until the 14th. And then God's very specific again. Okay, in verse 7, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses, the part above, in which they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted. And you shall not let any of it remain until the morning, but that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you should eat it, with your belt fast and your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste, for it's the Lord's Passover. Verse 12, highlight this one, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Okay, we've already seen the first nine plagues. God picked off their little G gods one by one by one. Remember, they had a God for everything, absolutely everything, over 2,000 deities in Egypt, a God for everything. And through the plagues, God just kept destroying them one by one by one. And he says right here, of all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. So let's talk about the blood. And we're not, if you're not Jewish, you wouldn't understand all the significance of this. Uh, first of all, they'd never been told to, to, how to kill a lamb this way. They're slaves in Egypt. They, the ones that are here getting ready to go through the Passover, these Israelites, they had lived in Egypt their whole life. They didn't know about sacrificing except the, the way the Egyptians sacrificed to their gods and all the things they did. They did a lot of human sacrifices, the Egyptians did. But this whole thing with the lamb and we need to collect the blood and what does all this mean? They had never cooked lambs like this. And there's a significance there too, okay? Lou, you're going, well, why is God telling them how they have to cook it? They're not supposed to boil it or why? Because none of the bones could be broken. That's why it had to be done this way. That's why it had to be roasted. Everything here points to Jesus Christ. Everything they're being told to do, okay? So he said, think about it. You're gonna, you have to do this for your family. You have to cook this lamb. Are they going to have big enough pots to put a whole lamb in and not have to break the bones to fit, fit it in there? So that's why God said, roast it. God is a God of details, okay? You need to roast it because none of the bones could be broken because none of Jesus' bones were broken. We see that in Psalm 3420. Psalm 3420. 
And then remember, we're going to be celebrating at Easter. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross and the Romans went to see if he was dead? Remember what they would usually do to finish off the prisoners who were dying on the cross? They'd be pushing up so they could get breath because they were asphyxiating on the cross. So to hasten it, the Roman soldiers would break their legs. Remember we saw in John chapter 19, the legs didn't need to be broken because Jesus was already dead, but that's because it had to fulfill this prophecy. God knows everything. There couldn't be any broken bones in the Passover lamb. There were no broken bones on our Passover lamb. Okay? So read John 19. You'll see it in verses 33 and 36, and you see it in the Old Testament in Psalm 34, verse 20. The bitter herbs were to show the bitterness of the bondage in Egypt. Why are they being told what to wear and how to wear their clothes when they're eating it? Because God's saying, get ready to go. This is going to come upon quickly. At midnight, this is going to be happening. Get ready to go. Have your robe tucked in to your belt. Have your sandals on. Be ready to go at a moment's notice. That's why it was unleavened. They didn't have time for the dough to rise. They brought unleavened bread. They didn't have time. God is just telling them, be ready to go. It's total obedience. That's what this is all about, total obedience. And it all pictures Jesus, our Passover lamb. Look these up later, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it talks about the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Remember John 1, what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus walking by? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29, they recognized it. And I love Paul. Paul brings everything together in, in all of his letters for people that might have missed it. 1 Corinthians 5.7, he says, Jesus is our Passover Lamb. Just for the people that might have missed all the symbolism, he puts it in words. 1 Corinthians 5.7, Jesus, our Passover Lamb. So everything just points right to Jesus through this. And, and as we go, just keep thinking, they'd never done this before. They truly didn't understand the significance or meaning. It's all about obedience. All about obedience. Look at Pharaoh. He saw the same nine plagues the Israelites did. He didn't have a heart of obedience. He kept fighting. But the Israelites, after seeing those nine plagues and what happened, God, you want us to jump? Okay, how high? All right? They obeyed, and they did what God told them to do with the Passover. Very shortly, they'll be complaining again, because that's what people do. But at this time, even though it made no intellectual sense to them, no logical sense, they did what God told them to do. How important was the blood? It was as conspicuous as possible. Right on your doorposts, right over the lintel, on the lintel, it was as conspicuous as possible. It was a distinguishing mark. What was the blood? A distinguishing mark. There were no secret believers then. You either had the blood on the door of your house or you didn't. No secret witnesses. There was no compromise position. You either had the blood on your house or you didn't. There was no political correctness. Well, the Egyptians might be offended by this. Well, if you don't have the blood on the door, you're losing your firstborn. No political correctness. Total obedience. The blood was the saving token. The next morning, every house had a dead body in it. It was either the firstborn or the lamb. Corpse in every house, the firstborn or the lamb. Only the blood separated the living from the dead. Only the blood. Is that making when we take communion seem even more amazing? It truly was the blood that saved. Conspicuous, distinguishing mark. The day's coming when the Antichrist and all of his cohorts come and there is going to be a mark of the beast. You have to take it to buy and sell. You have to take it to do this or that. Which mark are you going to have? The blood of Christ and be covered and going to heaven or the mark of the beast and be doomed to hell? What's your mark? This was the distinguishing mark. They put the blood on the door, they shut it, and they didn't open it until morning. You see, God told them to do that in Exodus 12, verse 22. None of you shall go out the door of your house until morning. Also notice, God didn't tell them to put blood on the threshold of the door. 
because we don't trample on the blood of Christ. Okay, think about that. Lintel on the top, posts on the side, our cross, just blood, blood, the blood of Christ on it. His blood was all over that cross because of the spikes in his hands, the nails in his feet. His back had been filleted by the 40 lat. They just ripped his back apart. So there's blood all over the cross. So here we are, blood on the lintel, blood on the doorpost, but don't you put that blood on the threshold because we don't trample on the blood of Christ. I like the way F.B. Meyer said, he said, we need to remember as we read those instructions, the Hebrews had never done anything like this before. They're, they're looking at this, we're looking at this thousands of years later, they'd never done anything like this before. They'd never roasted a lamb in this specific way. They'd never slain a lamb and used the blood this way. What logical reason was there for doing this with the blood? It seems so utterly extraordinary for such a thing to be as the deliverance of his people because blood happened to be sprinkled on the outside of their doors. There was no precedent, no apparent reason to justify such a thing to ordinary common sense, no likelihood of obedience having any connection with deliverance. But in God's wisdom, he said, do this, and they did, and they were saved. Look at the parallel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that simple. You must become just like a child to enter the kingdom of God. We look at them. God said put the blood over the door. They put the blood over the door and they were saved. Let the blood of Jesus Christ cover you. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It comes down to childlike faith then and now that the Israelites might not have felt like smearing lamb's blood on the door. And of course, they didn't understand. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? Your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and then 7, which I think we should always add, and don't be wise in your own eyes. Suddenly, the stillness was interrupted by scream and anguish as a mother rushed out into the night to tell that the angel of death had begun his work that was answered by the wail of a mother in agony for her firstborn, and this by another and another. It was useless to summon a priest, physician, magician. How could they help others who had not been able to ward off death of their own? Remember how Pharaoh relied on his magicians, and there were all these little G gods of healing? They couldn't even protect themselves, the magicians and the physicians and all of those. They were useless. In a stunning way, they found out that their little gods didn't work. If you want a parallel in the book of Revelation, read Revelation 18 when Babylon burns, when all the wealth, all the power, all the everything just goes up in smoke and can't save anybody. That's exactly what happens here. It was all destroyed. All the firstborns. There were no good people exemptions. But I'm a good person. Well, if you don't have the blood over the door, your firstborn's going to die. Yeah, but I give a lot at the temple. If you don't have the blood over the door, your firstborn's going to die. No favorable treatment. Obedience and faith. We're saved by grace through faith. We don't have to understand. We just need to do it. This touched me. It might touch some of you. I think as mothers, especially if you get a lot of that mama bear in you, right? And I bet you if you're a mom, an adopted mom, a spiritual mom, I bet you'd lay your life down for your child, your grandchild. And while that shows such great love, it does nothing. Listen to this, true story. A young man from Glasgow, England, fell into bad company, became a drunk, and ended up in prison. His depraved life grieved his godly mother. After he served his sentence, he went again to his mother's home. She asked him to sign a pledge that he would leave his old life. He said, Mom, I'm not going to sign another pledge. I need a power that can change me on the inside to do that. At least he saw that. Growing desperate, his mother took a knife and cut her arm, dipping the pen in her flowing blood. Son, sign it in your mother's blood. That may help you, she sobbed. Later, the young man stood in church and testified, what the blood of my mother could not do, the blood of Jesus Christ accomplished. As much as we love our children, our grandchildren, our spiritual children and grandchildren, our blood's not enough. We have to point them to his. And that young man became a minister of the gospel when he figured that out. And that was an um, illustration from Walter Knight.
So no matter how much we love the people in our lives, only the blood of Christ can save them. And really, honestly, when we look at, at the d- directions and not understanding, maybe our greatest struggle isn't understanding God's will, but obeying it. Choosing to obey even when we don't understand. And God passed over. Chapter 12, verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no pit plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land. And that's exactly what happened. The angel of death passed over the homes that had blood on the door. Jesus Christ, when we accept his sacrifice in our behalf, when we accept his blood, the angel of death is going to pass over us. We'll die a physical death, but then we get to go be with Jesus forever in heaven. And I just wonder, I I was very humbled when I read the next example, because how often do you thank Jesus for that blood? How often do you just stop in your tracks and thank him for the blood he shed for you? This just opened my eyes. Every Friday evening as the sun sets, there's a common sight at a Florida beach. An elderly man, Eddie, will be strolling towards his favorite pier, clutching in his hand a bucket of shrimp. He walks to the end of the pier and stands to enjoy the sight. Before long, however, he's no longer alone. Up in the sky, hundreds of white dots come screeching and squawking, flying their way towards this man standing at the end of the pier. Dozens of seagulls envelope him, him, their wings fluttering and flapping widely. Eddie stands there tossing shrimp to the hungry birds. As he does, if we're close enough to listen, we can hear him say, thank you, thank you. In a few short minutes, the bucket is empty. Eddie enjoys their presence for a moment and then walks back to the beach. He does that every week. His full name, Eddie Rickenbacker. He was a soldier who fought in World War II. You may recognize him. He was a very famous flying ace. During the war, flying missions across the Pacific, he and his seven-member crew went down. They crashed into the ocean. Miraculously, all of the men survived and crawled out of their plane and climbed into a life raft. Captain Eddie and his crew floated for days on the rough water. They fought sun and sharks, hunger and thirst. By the eighth day, their rations ran out. No food, no water. They were miles from land, and no one knew where they were. They needed a miracle. They prayed for one. They tried to nap. Eddie leaned back and pulled his military cap over his nose. Time dragged on endlessly, day after day. All he could hear was the slapping of the waves against the raft. Suddenly, Eddie felt something land on top of his hat. It was a seagull. Old Eddie would later describe how he sat perfectly still, planning his next move. With a flash of his hand, he managed to grab it and wring its neck. He tore the feathers off, and he and his starving crew made a meal of it, a very small meal for eight men. Then they used the intestines for bait. With it, they caught fish, which gave them food and more bait, and the cycle continued. With that simple survival technique, they were able to endure until they were found and rescued some 24 days later. Eddie Rickenbacker never forgot the sacrifice of that first life-saving seagull. Every Friday evening, he would walk to the end of the pier with a bucket of shrimp. It was his way of saying thank you. That so humbled me to go, okay, how often do I go out of my way just to sit and say thank you to Jesus? Thank you for the blood. So the Lord brings them out of Egypt so he can bring them in. So he can bring them into the land of promise. So he can bring them into all the blessings he has waiting for them. And he reminds them, before we move on too far in uh, chapter 12, verse 26, when you're commemorating this Passover every year, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You tell them. You tell them it's a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt and he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads in worship. That's just critical. Exodus 12, verse 26. We need to pass on the lessons God has shown us to our children and grandchildren, just so that they can share in our faith. We need to be emphatic about it. We need to be, just make sure we do it. So here comes the 10th plague, chapter 12, verse 29 at midnight. The Lord strikes them down. Great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was dead, was not dead. Then Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron in verse uh, 31 of chapter 12, and he says, get out. 
up, go out from my people, both you and the people of Israel, go, serve the Lord as you have said. All this could have been avoided. God told him before any of the plagues happened what was going to happen, but he didn't listen. And then he watched the first nine happen exactly as God said every time, because God kept warning him in advance. All of this could have been avoided. But now go and serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds of you have said and be gone. But then he throws in and bless me also. (laughs) Pharaoh was one of those guys. Don't you have those people in your life that say, and pray for me. And then you're kind of going, do you ever pray for yourself? Okay, pray for me. Pharaoh could have humbled himself before the Lord right there. Pharaoh had just lost his firstborn kid. He saw how powerful God is. He saw how real God is. But instead of humbling himself and surrendering, pray for me. Get out and pray for me. So they leave. And and we see in verse uh, 36, they plundered the Egyptians. We talked about that just as God had said. They took the silver and the gold. Verse 38, a mixed multitude also went out with very much livestock. Some of the Egyptians went too. Some of the Egyptians had chosen the blood. God came first for their, Jesus Christ came first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Romans 1 16. Okay, the mixed multitude, some of the Egyptians went with them. And they went out of the land of Egypt. And this is where, um, read all these things later, the institution of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But as I said, there's just so much application I don't wanna mi- uh, that I don't want to miss. God leads them out, but he doesn't lead them in a direct path. He makes it look like they're lost. God's got a plan even though it doesn't make sense to us. Okay, but he leads them very clearly, a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud. And when we go to chapter 13, verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of land of the Philistines. So he didn't lead them through the land of the Philistines. This is, we're going to pull this out because this is a huge, important application to us. God didn't lead them through the lands of the Philistines because lest the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. He didn't lead them through the land of the Philistines because God knew their hearts and knew that they would chicken out and just go back to Egypt. But look at how they're dressed. Look at at how they're dressed, though, in verse 18. The people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. They looked like warriors, but God knew the inside. He knew that if they saw a war, they'd chicken out. Oh, we're not going to fight. But yet they were dressed like warriors. So surely God said, you know what? <laughs> they're done. I'm not going to help them anymore. Look at, look at them. They're, they're acting all that. They're be- dressed for battle. But on the inside, they're chickens. But God didn't dump them. God kept working with them. God kept showing how much they love them. Let me ask you this. Do you present one way on the outside when that's really not how you're feeling on the inside? Do we do that? Can we be all confident and everything on the outside and inside our our insides are turning to mush? Do we try to act very confident when we're so insecure? God sees. He sees how we really are on the inside. And he loves you and works with you. Man looks at the outward appearance God looks at the heart. So you may be putting on an act for people. You, you see it in counseling all the time. I can't tell you how many ladies, uh, I, I, you know, they'll come and they'll present with, you know, my husband's really got issues. And he's a really lousy husband. And he, you know, and they start, and then after 15 minutes you're going, yeah, and you are incredibly uh, paranoid and extremely jealous. But you keep going on with what's wrong with your husband. Right? It's very easy to present one way and the inside's totally different. But where I'm going, and please get this, God loves your inside. He loves you. He knows you. So even though you may be putting on an act for everybody else, he sees right through the act. He sees right through the act, the facade, whatever it is that you're putting up out there, and he loves the inside of you. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And even these little shriveled hearts we have sometimes, he said, I love you, and I want to be with you, and I'm going to hold your hand. And we're going to go through this stuff together. He never is turned off by what he sees on the inside. If you just reach out to him. 
Isaiah 41, verse 10, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's Isaiah 41, 10. And I love this even more. Here's where God promises to hold your hand. Those of us with this nasty stuff inside that nobody else sees, look what God says. Isaiah 41, verse 13, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. He wants to hold hands with you. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. So here we have this perfect picture of these Israelites. And it even says later, they march out boldly. They march out defiantly. They look like they're all big and brave and all that, when inside they're not. And God just keeps working with them and keeps loving them and keeps helping them. It's uh, chapter 14, verse 8, that said they marched out boldly or defiantly. Chapter 14, verse 8. And God didn't give up. And he leads them. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. It didn't de- depart from before the people. Well, if I had a pillar of fire by day or a fire, pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, I'd know what God wants me to do too. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. We listen to him. He tells us to go left, to go right. If you're listening, if we're not quenching him, if we're opening our hearts to him, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So while we may go, yeah, I'd love to be able to follow this pillar, you have one in you. And then God brings him to the Red Sea. He tells, tells him, turn back. He makes it look like they don't know where they're going. God is giving instructions that makes it look like the Israelites are lost. Why would God do that? He has a plan. He's going to display his glory. When God tells us to do things that don't make a sense, God has a plan. He's going to display his glory. But I've been so involved in this ministry over here, and, and all of a sudden I can't do it because of health problems, family problems, whatever. What's the deal with that? God's going to display his glory. But you know what? We had a really good income, and we were giving so much of it away and helping people with it, and God took it all away when we lost our job. God's going to display his glory. He always has a reason, even though it doesn't make sense to us. He leads the people of Israel into a geographical cul-de-sac. It would be like if you had one of these gangs, MS-13, and you got 20 of them running after you, and God says, go down this road, and you go down that road, and you're at a dead end. That's what he did to the Israelites. He took them to a dead end. In one area, fortifications and, all, and mountains and rocks and all this stuff that the Egyptians had, and then over here, the barren desert, and then Pharaoh's army coming after them. Can you imagine? These people had never had a taste of freedom, never. In their whole lives, they lived in slavery in Egypt, and God frees them. And now they're walking together, and it would be about 2 million of them. It says there were 600,000 men, so scholars estimate 2 to 3 million because of the women and children. Let's just go on the low end. 2 million. You've never been free before. You've worked 24-7 with Egyptian taskmasters standing over you. You're free now. Can you imagine what that walk must have sounded like? Oh my gosh, how loud, how joyous, talking, being with your family, you're free. God tells you to go here with this pillar, you're doing it all, and you come to a dead end. And here comes this army, Pharaoh's army coming at you. And you know what? When it says 600 chariots and then more chariots, how many, really, they estimate about 1,000 chariots come in at the Israelites. Does it really matter how many? Let's ask this. How many chariots did the Israelites have? Zero. So whether it's 600 or 1,000, they had none. And here they are standing here. This God leads them out, and now God puts them right here, and they think they're going to die. That's where our saying, we're all going to die, came from. Right there, by the Red Sea right there. And you know these chariots on top of it, when I was doing my research looking at the Hebrew word, they were three-man chariots. So just the men in the chariots, if there's 600 of them, that's 1,800 troops coming at you, not counting the ones that are marching. 1,800 pointy spears, bows and arrows, rocks, that's coming at you. You've had a taste of freedom. They think it took about a week to get to the Red Sea. A taste of freedom, and here they are hunting you like a dog and you got the Red Sea at your back. What are they going to do? Who are they going to believe in? And these people that were all dressed up, 
but not ready, that marched out boldly in 14 verse 8. Now by two verses later, 14.10, they feared greatly. They went from marching out boldly a week ago to now they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. At least they did that right. They went to the right place. They cried out to the Lord. But then they said to Moses, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Pure sarcasm. Do you know that a third to three quarters of the land in Egypt was graves? What do you think those pyramids were for? There's at least 110 of them, and most of them are holding remains of Pharaoh. If you were here last week, I talked about they made tombs for bulls. In Memphis, Egypt, that when they unearthed it, they found 64 huge rock-hewn tombs for bulls. They buried everything there because it was all gods. The pharaohs were gods. The bulls were gods. Egypt's covered with graves. So look at the sarcasm of the Israelites. Is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you took us away to die in the wilderness? They would have rather stayed slaves. And you know what? We can choose that. We can stay slaves to sin if we so choose, but we don't have to. And they're attacking Moses. What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Did you free us from there just to die in the wilderness? And Moses, in verse 13, and we'll break it down, he says four things. Fear not. We've talked about the 365 do not be afraid in the Bible. Here's one right here. Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord that he will work for you to, which he will work for you today. Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. And I love verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. He will fight for you, so shut up. Okay? What is wrong with them? Talk about a 15-minute memory. And I can say this because none of us have this. A 15-minute memory. So you're marching out defiantly, and next thing you know, you fear greatly. 15-minute memory. What has God done in your life, this miraculous thing that you swore you would never forget that he did this for you, and by now you're, say what? He did what? We have a 15-minute memory, same as they did. So what do we do to overcome that? You keep your face in the book to see what God has done. You keep a little journal, and I I get it. I, I hate sitting there long enough to write something too, but it sure is a quick way to remember. And I know some really smart people, they jot their little remembrances right in the book, right in the front of their Bible or along the side, answered prayers so they can go right back, look what God has done. Look at what we started talking about, the wonders of God. Because we do have 15-minute memories. And I don't know about you, but I find as I get older, I wish I still had a 15-minute memory. It's shorter than that. Okay, but you've got to have a way to remind yourself so when the enemy is just beating the heck out of you, you can go back and say, this is what God has done. When you feel trapped, when you're in an impossible situation, because newsflash, as we can see right here, God loves impossible situations. He puts people in impossible situations on purpose so that he can show his glory, so that he can rescue you. So we can turn into a puddle waiting for the rescue or we can confidently wait because we know, look what God has done before. He rescued me here. He rescued me here. He rescued... So whatever it looks like for you, find a way to track God's faithfulness in your life. There are times we're going to need to remember. This is F.B. Meyer again. Often God seems to place his children in positions of profound difficulty leading them into a wedge from which there is no escape, designing a situation that no human judgment would have permitted if it had been previously consulted. The very cloud directs you there. You may be involved in a situation like this at this very hour. It does seem perplexing and mysterious to be in that situation, but it's perfectly right. The issue will more than justify him who has brought you there. It's a platform for the display of his almighty grace, and power. Not only that he will deliver you, but in doing so, he'll give you a lesson you will never forget. Don't miss that. Not only will he deliver you, if not in this moment, ultimately, when you get to go to heaven to be with Jesus, but in doing so, he'll give you a lesson you will never forget. His plans aren't always logical. 
but his plans are always made in advance. You know, the one thing God's not, God is not reactionary because he always knows what's coming. He always knows what's coming. He's not reactionary. <laughs> like this, and this was unattributed, or I'd give you the author's name. God writes in characters too grand for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom all the mystery of withered hopes of death, of life, the endless war, the useless strife. But there with larger, clearer sight, we shall see this. His way was right. That's God's handwriting that we'll understand when we get to heaven. God's plans don't need our help either. He doesn't need our help. He only needs our obedience. Fear not. Stand still. Watch. Keep silent. A better translation, hold your peace. All of these reactions go, again, are, go against our natural response to panic, don't they? When you're in trouble, it's fight or flight. That's what our adrenaline does to us, fight or flight. And God's saying, fear not, stand still, watch, and keep silent. And then when he tells them to move, he wants them to move. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people to go forward. When God tells them to move, they're supposed to move. And then highlight verse 19 of chapter 14. He's told them to move, and don't miss that. Then the angel of God, who is going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. You know our little expression, I got your back? God's got their back. The pillar of cloud moves from the front to the back. He's got their backs. The Egyptians are coming at them, and he's got their backs. And it says the, the Egyptians, they were in darkness. The Israelites... They were in the light. Go read 1 John chapter 1 about darkness and light and where you want to be. The Israelites are in the light. God has got their backs. They're in the light. The Egyptians are in the darkness of judgment. He's got your back. So look, just look at the things we're pulling out. He's holding your hand. He's got your back. He knows everything inside of you and loves you and is leading you and guiding you anyway. He never gives up on us. He's got us surrounded. But how's he going to get them out of this? They're surrounded on all sides. It's not humanly possible, but it's godly possible, verse 21. Moses stretched out his hand, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall on their right and their left. He just parted the waters, and it wasn't going to be the first time. You ever thought about how this mimics creation? Remember what happened in Genesis 1-9? God separated the land from the water. He put water in the sky. He separated the oceans from the land. And we see in the book of Job, he told the oceans, you can only go this far, water. This is going to be land over there. The oceans obey God, even though people don't. But the oceans obey God. God said, you stay there. He did it in creation. He did it in the Jordan. He parted for Elisha and Elijah to get across. This is nothing new for God. God can part the sea. But yet scholars are all over this, scholars in quotes. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. It's, it's a sea of reeds. It's so shallow. You know what? Rather than make up little stories, isn't it easier just to believe? Isn't it easier just to believe than sit here and have to come up with all these things? Because that doesn't make any sense that it was six inches of water and it was just the sea of reeds because what happens to the Egyptians? They drown. So really, okay, okay, you guys, you atheists, you people that refuse to believe, fine, but what's the bigger miracle? That God parted the waters and the Israelites went across or the whole Egyptian army and all their chariots and all their fighting men died in six inches of water? <laughs> Come on. Really? It's a miracle either way. Don't be one of those people. If God said it, it happened. And let's not be ridiculous. We talked about how they try to explain all the plagues away as natural phenomenon. Well, that doesn't work either. Bugs just stop. Some cattle die of pestilence and others don't. It's easier just to believe. It's easier just to put the blood over the door. 
Just obey and believe. The stand still part's tough, isn't it? We tend to be when things are happening in our lives, oh my gosh, we got to fix it, we got to fix it, we got to fix it, I got to do something, I got to get my little fingers in there, there's this problem, my friend has a problem, my kid has a problem, I, I got to fix it. And God says, stand still. Let me give you some biblical examples of people who stood still. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were told to stand still. They got thrown into the fiery furnace, and they told Nebuchadnezzar, you know what, if God chooses to rescue us, great. And if he doesn't, we're still going to stand here. They stood still. Daniel, when he was told not to pray anymore, he stood still and he prayed. Paul and Silas get thrown in jail. You'd think that was standing still. They sang and prayed all night. But you know who really stood still? The one in the Garden of Gethsemane all by himself. The one in the Garden of Gethsemane that could have called legions of angels to help him. And when God says, you're going to that cross to redeem these people that I love, he stood still. The God of all creation. Because Jesus Christ, everything was created by him and for him and through him. That's Colossians 1.15. He stood still to get up there so we could be covered with the blood. You see this beautiful picture, how it keeps tying together? He stood still so he could do that for us so we could be covered with his blood. So they're told, stand still. God grant me, this is from Sir Paul Reeves, he wrote this in Australia, God grant me to be silent before you, that I may hear you, at rest in you, that you may work in me, open to you, that you may enter, empty before you, that you may fill me, let me be still and know that you are my God. Amen. God grant me to be silent before you, that I may hear you, at rest in you, that you may work in me, open to you, that you may enter, empty before you, that you may fill me, let me be still, and know that you are my God. If anybody wants a copy of that, we can make some after. We just cruised through 15 pages of notes. Okay. I do want to get a few more applications, though. So there's nowhere to run, but there be God. There be God, and he parts the sea, and they go through, and then the sea closes in on the Egyptians, and it, it ends in, uh, in Exodus 14 with, so the people feared the Lord. Remember, fear of the Lord is reverential awe that leads to obedience. The people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And, and we know they're going to get out to the wilderness and be complaining and mumbling, and where is God, and he's not showing up. That's why we talked about having to have a way to remember, to spark our 15-minute memory. But never forget, never, ever forget over your life, there be God. There's, I haven't seen it personally. I've just read about it so many times. I'd love to see it. It's over in a maritime museum in London. They, there's this ancient mariner's map that the sailors made, and it was long before any technology. They didn't know how deep the oceans were. They didn't know what was in them. They just knew that they needed to navigate them. So they made this great big map, and they put like parts of it, there be rocks. And remember, they'd see the sea creatures, but they wouldn't know what they were, so they'd put there be dragons, there be sea monsters. They wrote it all over the map where these things they saw were in their own terms, sea monsters, dragons, rocks, whatever. But then somebody came in afterwards and put over the top of the whole map, which some may be saying ruined it, but it didn't, it was truth. Over the whole map they wrote, there be God. So over this whole map there's dragons and sea monsters and rocks, but there be God. Let that be stamped over your life. When we have our Red Sea moments, when we're trapped, when things look impossible, when there's no way out, when we're camped out in bitterness and hatred and envy and pride and we're stuck with all this stuff and we're trying to figure out how to get out of that death cul-de-sac, all these things, when we have rocks and trials and tribulations through our life and when we have incredible joy and peace because we have Jesus Christ. But when you look over the map of your life, isn't that what you want just stamped over the whole thing? There be God. Because he's with you all the time, watching over you all the time. 
So recognize his purpose, even if you don't understand it. You know he has a plan and he has a purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11 is such a bumper sticker, such a, a plaque thing, such a t-shirt thing, but it's true. He knows the plans he has for you, and they're to prosper you and not to harm you, and to give you hope and a future, and he's giving you a future forever with him in heaven. So recognize that he has a plan and a purpose, even if you don't understand it at the moment, and it is for your good, because he's working all things for the good of those who love him who are called according for his purpose, retain his perspective. How do we do that? How can we have God's perspective? You stay in his word. That's how you keep God's perspective. You stay in his word. Lord, I want to see things like you do. Lord, I want to see people like you do. Maintain his perspective. You may see this person in a way that you totally don't like her. What's God's perspective? She's made in his image. We need to love on her. We keep God's perspective. Lord, everything's dark. Well, he's saying, I am the light. That's what Jesus said. Keep his perspective and rely on his promises. So we recognize his purpose, retain his perspective, and rely on his promises. We have to change our thinking with God. We just do. There's nothing impossible with him. We have to change our thinking. And just because you feel surrounded like there's no way out, like it's hopeless, it's not. Annie Johnson Flint said, pressed out of measure and pressed to all length, pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength. You ever felt like that? I just can't take one more thing, God. At my wit's end or at the end of myself or whatever that looks like, pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength. Pressed in the body, pressed in the soul, pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll. Pressure by foes, pressure by friends, pressure on pressure till life nearly ends. Pressed into loving the staff and the rod, pressed into knowing no helper but God, pressed into liberty where nothing clings, pressed into faith for impossible things, pressed into a life in the Lord, pressed into living the Christ life outpoured. We keep our eyes on him and his perspective. We have to change our thinking. Because God, if he's going to get the glory, he has to do the fighting. So we need to surrender to him. Not a single weapon did those Israelites have. And we talked about the chariots and all the men, and this was a trained army coming after them. They didn't have a single weapon. They had their babies with them. They had their kids with them. They had their elderly people with them. And who fought for them? And remember this, too, and this is a tough one for those of us in waiting periods. The Red Sea opens and closes at God's command and not until. The Red Sea opens and closes at God's command and not until. I thought this was really smart. This was Charles Swindoll. He said, do you know that the clock is one of the greatest detriments to a life of faith? The clock is one of the greatest detriments to a life of faith. God doesn't tell time like we do. God doesn't bow to our timepiece. He doesn't jump to our alarm bells. He ignores our deadlines and removes our crutches. He will leave that particular Red Sea, whatever Red Sea you're standing at, absolutely closed, without an opening, without a sign, until he has finished teaching us the lessons we need to learn. That's why we have to be told to stand still. Be still and know that I am God. We're on his time. Raymond Edmond, the book is called Discipline, The Disciplines of Life. He calls it the discipline of delay. This is a, all a quote. We live in a restless, impatient day. We have little time for preparation and less for meditation or worship. We feel we must be active and energetic, humanly effective. We can't understand why inactiv- inactivity, weakness, weariness, and seeming uselessness should be our lot. It appears so foolish and futile without plan or purpose. But don't miss this. He said the delay that instructs and prepares us saves time, never loses it. Think about that. The delay that instructs and prepares us saves time, never loses it. I'm sure you have heard of Hudson Taylor. I had too. What I had heard, he went in and he evangelized China, and I had heard about his perseverance. 
He went in and felt like he wasn't winning anybody to Christ. Nobody was coming to Jesus. But he kept showing up day after day after day, preaching Christ and loving on people. And then thousands upon thousands came to Christ. But what I didn't know, I I know he lost a wife, he lost a child on the missionary field to disease. But what I didn't know, he went through a season of delay too. He was an invalid at 29 years old. After six years of service in China, he was in London with his little family. Outside interest lessened, friends began to forget him, and for five long hidden years, they were spent in the dreary streets of a poor part of London, where the tailors were shut up to prayer and patience. As the years of obscurity progressed, and when the discipline was complete, they emerged to go to the inland mission in China, first a little root, but then God filled China with fruit through Hudson Taylor. When we recall the name of Hudson Taylor, does anyone ever mention the five years of obscurity in the poor part of London? We're more prone to emphasize the prominent things about him. But remember this, China was reached because a man was faithful behind the scenes, patiently waiting with his family for the Red Sea to open. That's a lesson for all of us, and until we learn it, we're going to stay stuck in the cul-de-sac. God kept him on ice, as we would say, for five years I want to serve you, Lord. I want to go do this, Lord. Why have you got me here? Because he opens and closes the Red Sea as he chooses. Like I said, we, there's a lot more to read. I just wanted to, to really hit the highlights because there are just so many lessons here. And I think as more and more things happen in our world and we feel out of control, we may feel stuck in a cul-de-sac, we may feel hopeless, If nothing else, this shows us that nothing is impossible with God. And he can part any sea, and he'll make a way, and it doesn't matter how scary the enemy looks. Just put yourself weak-kneed with those Israelites standing by the Red Sea, watching death come at you, if you look at it that way, and look what God did. He had their backs. He watched over them. He made a way, as he will for us. There's a book called Ghost Soldiers, And Hampton Sides tells a story of a dramatic mission during World War II. We're going to close with this. On January 28, 1945, 121 hand-selected Army Rangers slipped behind enemy lines in the Philippines. They were trying to rescue 513 American and British POWs who had spent three years in a hellish prison there. He describes the first effects of liberation as chaos and fear. The prisoners were too mentally brittle to understand what was taking place. Some even scurried away from their liberators. One particular prisoner, Bert Bank, refused to budge, even when a ranger walked right up to him and tugged his arm. His arm, Come on, we're here to save you. Run to the gate. Bank wouldn't move. The ranger looked into his eyes and saw they were vacant, registering nothing. What's wrong with you, he said. Don't you want to be free? A smile formed on Bank's lips as the meaning of the words became clear and he reached up his outstretched hand to the army ranger. The ranger searched all the barracks for additional prisoners and then shouted, the Americans are leaving, is anybody here? Hearing no answer, they left. But there was one more POW, Edwin Rose. Edwin had been on latrine duty and somehow missed all the shooting and explosions. Ever feel like that's your life, stuck in the bathroom while stuff happens? But anyway, (laughs) when he wandered to his barracks, he failed to notice the room was empty. And he went, laid down on his straw mat and fell asleep. Edwin had missed the liberation. But there was a reason Edwin was deaf. Four Americans died in the rescue, two rangers in the firefight, and two prisoners who perished for reasons of poor health. The freed prisoners marched 25 miles and boarded their ship home. With each step, their stunned belief gave way to soaring optimism. Even Edwin Rose made it. He finally woke up and realized freedom had come. Eugene Peterson puts it this way. The gospel message says, you don't live in a mechanistic world ruled by necessity. You don't live in a random world ruled by chance. You live in a world ruled by God, the God of the Exodus and the God of Easter. And he will do things in you that neither you nor your friends would have supposed possible. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you that you love the likes of us. Lord, I thank you that you know us so completely and love us so incredibly. Lord, I just pray that whatever situations we're in today, whether it's a season of delay, 
whether we feel trapped, whether we're uneasy about the future, whether we are just afraid. Lord, I pray that we turn that to just joyous confidence in you. Jesus, I thank you for the blood you shed for us. Lord, I pray that all of us choose your liberation, your freedom. Father, I pray that we don't walk back into slavery, that we just stay free in you and this wonderful, incredible life you have for us and ultimately the incredible life you have for us in heaven. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you did on that cross. May we never forget to thank you every day for that. And Lord, thank you just for giving us the freedom here to study your word. Jesus, thank you for loving us. In your precious name, amen.